As you know, I work for Facebook. Uh, for the last year or so, um, we've been replacing our existing uh, CF Engine 2 infrastructure uh, with something built on Chef. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Uh, and so I think you already know that, that Facebook is pretty large. And system configuration. So those are the two things. Um, I really hate it when people give talks, especially keynote talks, and uh, don't tell you why you should listen to them. Uh, so I'm going to do one slide that really quickly sums up why I think I'm uh, qualified to discuss both configuration management and scale. Uh, and if at the end of that slide you don't think I'm qualified to talk about that, you should get up and leave, and I will not be offended. Um, use that time to get some breakfast. So uh, when it comes to configuration management, uh, in the early to mid-2000s, I worked at uh, Ticketmaster. And we wrote a piece of software called Spine, which was a response to CF Engine 2 because we didn't want to use it. Uh, it wasn't flexible enough for a fairly large dynamic environment. I also wrote a piece of software called Provision, which would uh, allocate VMs and in in, in other resources, filer space and that sort of stuff needed to get a system up and running uh, that could run uh, Spine. And I also have experience at scale. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked at Ticketmaster, which when I left was about 6,000 systems. I went to Google, which, as you can imagine, also has lots and lots of systems. And now I work at Facebook, which has many, many systems, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So that's me. And as I said, I'm talking about scaling configuration management. Um, and in order to talk about that, we have to start with scale. So what is scale? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of scale. And so there's a couple questions you have to ask yourself um, when you're trying to figure out how uh, what kinds of scale you have and, and how it is that you want to scale your configuration management. Um, and so the first thing you might ask yourself when trying to determine the kind of scale you have is how many homogenous systems can you maintain? And uh, homogenous systems are a very specific uh, uh, need. So if you have, say, a large HPC-style cluster, um, it may be sufficient for you to um, it may be sufficient for you to use, say, Rdist or Rsync. Um, and in fact, IBM wrote a set of tools called XCAT, which is very, very good at managing tons and tons of systems that need to be completely identical. Um, and so <clears throat> you might also have to ask yourself, how many heterogeneous systems can you maintain? And I'm going to venture a wild guess here and say that's the majority of the people in this room. Um, you're running an app, and you have web servers, and, and, and database servers, and cache servers, and proxy servers. Or perhaps you're internal IT, and you have email servers, and DNS servers. Um, and so running heterogeneous systems is an entirely different problem. You have some overlap in all of your configuration, and you have a whole bunch of divergence. And how you express that divergence is going gonna, is gonna to matter a lot in how you scale. You definitely need to ask yourself how many people are going to be needed to understand this configuration and to express um, whether it be homogeneous or heterogeneous, to express that configuration and grok all of those configs. And finally, um, one question that I think a majority of you are going to um, want to ask, even if you don't know it yet, is can I safely delegate delta configuration? Is there a dude somewhere who's going to want to change some config on some set of systems, and can I let him do that in a way that doesn't scare the crap out of me? So when you understand the kinds of scale you might need, you need a goal. At Facebook, our goal was we wanted four people to manage at least tens of thousands of heterogeneous systems. And I can't give exact numbers, but I'm, I'm, I'm being nice. So service owners, uh, we also wanted service owners to be able to adjust and own their own configuration. And I'm going to define service owners for you, because it's a term we use internally that may mean different things to different people. By service owners, I mean the people who own various parts of the infrastructure, which in Facebook's case is often developers. Um, at Facebook, it is very common for people who are writing a chunk of the software to own their own infrastructure until such time as they get large enough or mature enough to warrant an, operationally or, uh, an operational team. And when I say operational team, I'm talking about what most people here would refer to as DevOps. So with a goal in mind, now you need to figure out what it is you need to achieve this goal. And so everyone's going to need some building blocks. Building blocks are useful. We played with them in school. And so what building blocks do you need? The first thing we decided we needed, and that I think everyone here would need, is a distributed system. And obviously, we picked Chef, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, but I think the, impor the, the important point here is that um, it's important to understand what it is you're trying to build when you're picking any tool, whether it be a configuration management tool um, or a deployment tool or anything else. 
Distribution on your tool is critical because when you scale your application, whether that be your LAMP stack or your um, email servers or whatever else, um, if you then also have to figure out how to scale your configuration management, you have now introduced an additional problem to your environment, and that sucks. But if it's distributed, as you scale your app, you are inherently scaling your configuration management environment, and that's awesome. It's got to be deterministic. This is a pet peeve of mine. Um, when my configuration management system is done running and exits successfully, I damn well better have the machine I expect to have. Uh, eventual consistency is not sufficient here. I do not want to have to run my tool two or three or five or 10 or 20 times. It's got to be idempotent, only the necessary changes. Uh, if I tell you to install OpenSSH, please don't try and install it every time I run you. It's got to be extensible. Um, obviously, Facebook is a large environment, has tons of internal systems. Um, but I've worked at dot-coms, and the one thing that has been true everywhere I've ever worked has been there is some internal system, whether that be some flat files or um, a database or some complex internal system. There's always been something internal that I wanted to leverage from within my configuration management system. And I'm willing to bet every single one of you has one of these. It's got to be flexible. Um, I have a workflow. You have a workflow. Uh, at Facebook, we have a very prescribed workflow. We do code reviews before we commit. We commit to head. We push twice a day. Um, every one of you will have a workflow, and it's not acceptable to pick a tool that's going to make you change your workflow. So that's the first thing we need, building blocks. The second thing we need is configuration is data. And that is possibly a new concept to a lot of people. Um, but what do I mean by that? Well, if I'm a service owner, a developer, or one of these ops teams, um, I know things. What do I know? I know I need a VIP. Or you know, I have a memory-intensive application. I want more shared memory. Or you know what? I actually would like all my core files in some other place. Um, I know all sorts of things. But what I probably don't know is how to configure VIPs on my machine, or how to move where my core files are. Um, I also probably, just because I want to move a core file which is controlled by a syscontrol, I probably don't know what every other optimal syscontrol on my machine should be. I may not know what my netmask is or what LDAP server I need to connect to. And so by allowing people to express what they want as data, whether that be arrays or hashes or some type of data, we abstract things out so that as a developer or as an operations person, you get to use very common, easy to understand things to say, hey, here's this list of packages I need. Here's this hash of syscontrols I need, whatever. I want to express all of this stuff as data so that you don't have to know if you're running on a Red Hat box or an Ubuntu box or how to set those things up or what conflicts you may have. The third and final thing we need is flexibility. And I've talked about flexibility a couple times. Um, and in fact, I've talked about adapting to your workflow a couple times already. Um, but there's other things that come into flexibility. So um, super fast prototyping is really critical. Uh, in our industry, we have this common joke, especially on the operations side, that people come to us and go, hey, I need this thing. OK, well, I can work on that. When do you need it by? Well, I need it by yesterday. Um, you've all heard it. And at Facebook, we, um, we take that to a whole new level sometimes, where people come to us and they say, hey, I know we have tons and tons of clusters all over the world. Um, I need this change, and I need it like within the next hour before the push happens. Um, and so we wanted a tool that we could prototype quickly, test, and deploy quickly. Um, and we had tools, but we wanted something better. And so <clears throat> the reality of it is you may not have that, those sorts of time crunches in your environment, or you might. But the faster you can prototype things, the faster you can test things, the easier your job gets, even if you don't have to push it out for a week. We wanted a tool where the internal assumptions of that tool could be changed really easily. Um, no matter what tool you pick, whether you pick Chef or Puppet or CF Engine or BCFG2 or Spine, the reality of it is there is no tool out there that is going to have the exact same internal assumptions of everything you're ever going to do. It's just not possible. And so a tool where we could change the assumptions that it's making was really critical to us. Finally, we wanted a tool where we could extend it in new ways really easily. Um, there's always going to be a feature you want that they just didn't think of. And if I have to patch the tool and rebuild the tool and deploy the tool, that's just another headache I have. I don't want to do that. I just want to be able to extend it easily. So let's look at an example of what I mean by flexibility. And it doesn't encompass everything on that slide. But and give you some idea of the kind of um, flexibility we wanted. So 
if you have a bunch of different systems that need a bunch of different configurations at the kernel level, a bunch of different sys controls, uh, different shared memory segments, different TCP write memory sec um, um, values, et cetera, you might have lots and lots of different syscontrol.coms, but you don't want a different file that you have to manage for every single possible combination there. So one way of solving this would be to templatize it. And if you're going to templatize it, what we really wanted to be able to do was to have this big hash of every syscontrol that we might want to set and some pretty sane defaults for our environment. We would then want everyone to be able to have some code that's going to run on their server that says, hey, I'm going to override this hash only where I need to. And then at the very end of the run of whatever tool we picked, we wanted it to take that modified hash and write out a syscontrol.conf. So that's the kind of flexibility we're talking about here. So we had to go pick a tool, and um, obviously we picked Chef. And in a previous version of this talk I gave, there was a big, long section on all the things we looked at and why. And I cut most of that out, because I'm pretty sure most of you are sold on Chef. But there is one thing I want to talk about. When we decided to, uh, to choose Chef, um, there's a million great things about Chef. I can also say a million great things about a lot of other tools. But there's a problem with Chef, and I think it's, it really points out why we picked Chef. For us, one of the biggest problems we were going to run into was node save. And for those of you who haven't dug into the internals of Chef, at the end of every Chef run, um, it calls node.save, which takes your entire node object, all of the attributes, everything Ohio discovered, the number of resources that were updated, the amount of time it took, all of that stuff, and shoves it up to the Chef server. And if you're a small company, or if you don't have a, your own um, inventory management system, voila, you have an inventory management system for free. And that's fucking awesome. However, if you're Facebook, you already have an inventory management system. And we like our inventory management system. Moreover, we have really big clusters. And so if you want to take, say, 10 or 15,000 nodes, and you want to run Chef every 15 minutes, you can't take a couple hundred K of data and send it over the network to a box. Because I don't want to melt my switches. So we looked at all the standard solutions, and really there was one standard solution, and the standard solution was disable OHI plugins. And I was like, well, but I don't want to disable OHI plugins. I like knowing what file systems I have. I like knowing what you know, users I have. I like knowing that stuff. That's all really useful. I just don't want to send it to the Chef server. So the solution for us was whitelist node adders, which is now an open source cookbook, but did not exist when we sat down to, to deploy Chef. So, um, in fact, Adam and I sat down and we were looking at how uh, Facebook might use Chef, Adam Jacob, and um, we wrote this thing and it went through many different iterations. And the final iteration was um, this thing that reopened the save method on the node object and deleted everything that wasn't in a whitelist and then ran the original node save. Really super simple. And we needed a whitelist. Well, we stuck that whitelist in a node attribute so that you can change it anywhere in your run. We actually send less than a kilobyte of data from every one of our machines back to the server now. Um, I don't want to get super into code in this talk. Um, however, I do want to point out that there's essentially five lines of code here that are making this work. We walk through every one of the hashes internal to the node object, and we delete a bunch of stuff. I'm cheating slightly here because the filter function isn't on this screen. It's about 20 lines. Um, but ultimately, this was the code that made that work. And I'm pretty sure everyone in this room will agree that that's super flexible. I want to point out here that I am not advocating you monkey patch the internals of Chef every time you need to deploy a new application. Um, however, when you run into a core assumption of a tool that's just not going to work in your environment, the ability to change the way it internally functions in five lines of code is pretty awesome. And we actually did this two or three times. So let's talk a little bit about the workflow that we have. Um, and the workflow that we wanted to build. We wanted to provide an API for anyone, anywhere, and when I say anyone, I mean all these service owners, to be able to modify any config that they needed by simply munging data structures wherever possible. We wanted engineers to be able to do this without having to understand all of the other things that happen to be in configuration management. So for example, just because you want to add a new IP address doesn't mean you should have to know about all the other IP addresses that may be on that box. Just because you want to move your core files doesn't mean you have to understand the TCP memory settings. 
We wanted engineers to be able to change their systems without fear of changing any other system in the environment, because we have a lot of them. And if you're a DBA and you have to worry about changing some setting and if that's going to break all the web servers, or God forbid you're working on the web servers and you're worried about changing, like screwing up the database servers, which is even worse, that sucks. You're never going to change anything. And you're going to expect some other team to change it for you, and that sucks. We also wanted testing to be really easy. If testing is not easy, people don't test. End of story. If you force people to test and it's not easy, then they just don't do anything. And all of those suck. So there's one other piece. Um, and this is where this talk will diverge from probably every other configuration management talk you've ever seen. And where our internal setup of Chef um, differs mostly from, from every other one you'll see. There's not a name for this. I had to come up with one. And it's not a very good one, because I suck with naming. But I wanted to move item potency up the stack. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you have an item potent record, um, well, sorry, let me rephrase. Every configuration management system out there I know uh, tends to deal with, with records. So you have a resource for a cron job. You have a resource for a user. And so those manage a record, right? Cron is a system. A cron job is a record. At C password is a system, a user is a record. So if you add a cron resource in one of your cookbooks, and you push it out, and now you have this cron job everywhere, and then a month later you're like, I don't need this cron job anymore, and you go and you delete those lines from your cookbook, nothing happens. New systems will come up without that cron job, but your cron job doesn't go away. And so now you have this stale cron job everywhere. And so there's a couple solutions to this. You can be one of those guys who now writes a one-off job to go out and delete that cron job, and that's super fucking ugly. You can go and change your cookbook to say action delete, uh, and add a comment to say, hey, please clean up this code later, which no one's going to do. Um, but either way around, you have, a really ugly, you have a really ugly problem. Compare this to an item potent system. What if Chef managed cron as a whole? or users as a whole, or syscontrols as a whole. Now, if I remove an entry from my configuration management, Chef, does, Chef goes, oh, well, I manage all the things, and this is, this is not a thing. I will remove it. Now you get cleanup for free. And what does that look like? Well, it's a little hard to see this diff, I'm sure, from out there. But this is a uh, picture of a diff from, from uh, Fabricator, which is our, configuration, our, our code review tool. Um, and basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking a dummy cron, dummy user thing that I made up, and I'm adding action delete. And then there's a comment up there that says, please remove this after March 1st. Um, and that sucks. Like, no one's going to clean that shit up. What's better is this. Delete your crap, move on with your life. So how do we get there? <clears throat> we do this with a lot of different cases. Um, I'm going to take one example and walk you guys through how we do this. And you'll recognize that I talk about syscontrols a lot. And we're going to look at syscontrol again for this case study. Why do I talk about syscontrol so much? Well, before we rolled out Chef, we had uh, CF Engine 2. And in CF Engine 2, we had 157 copies of syscontrol.conf for every possible combination. Because what happened was some dude was like, hey, I want my core file somewhere else. I'm going to copy the syscontrol that goes to web servers, because why not? And I'm going to change my one line. And then I'm going to check it in. And what happens there is you now have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stale, stale lines in that file. And then someone else comes along and goes, well, you know what? For that internal web server, I kind of look like an internal web server, and I want to make a change to some other syscontrol, so I'm going to copy internal web server co file, and I'm going to make my change. And now you have hundreds of more stale entries. And there was no way to correlate any of this crap. There's certainly no way to tell what lines were important in each file. So we decided we were going to uh, start there. We wanted to solve that problem, or at least I did. So we wrote a cookbook. It's called FB Syscontrol, and it's super simple. In attributes, we walk, um, we build a hash, and that hash is every possible syscontrol we could care about. Um, and it's mostly the kernel defaults, but in many cases, we actually look at the hardware, and we decide we want to bump things up or down. And we basically do a little bit of calculation to come up with pretty much what you want. Like, the, for the vast majority of people at Facebook, these are going to work for you. We then have a recipe, which defines a template. And of course, that template also notifies sys a syscuttle to run when it changes. Um, and then we have a template. And that template is three lines, um, <clears throat> minus a comment. 
And so for those of you who uh, may be new to Chef um, and are looking at this code going, what the hell is that? Uh, all I'm doing is looping over a hash and then printing out key space equals space value. That's it. And what the result is is the bottom. You can see the snippet of a syscontrol.conf here. And you're going, well, that doesn't seem so sexy. I mean, it works, but why is that awesome? And here's why that's awesome. Because on a database server, I can give the DBAs a cookbook, and they can have two lines to say that they want more shared memory. Two lines. They know how to assign things to a hash. They don't have to know about any other syscontrol. They just assign these two values. And on their box, those two values will be set. And if they decide they don't want those anymore, they delete them. And, they, and then Chef runs 15 minutes later, and voila, those settings are gone. How does this help us scale? Well, <clears throat> for starters, this gives us a lot of heterogeneity because all we're expressing is the, the way you differentiate from the common case. The DBAs do not have to know everything on their box. They only have to know the things they want to change. That's that's so expressive and minimizes the number of things you actually need to codify that your heterogeneity becomes simpler. Um, fewer people are needed to manage configs because the core chef team does not have to understand every possible config combination across all of our fleet. Um, and obviously, delegation is really simple because I can give people a cookbook and they can assign values to hashes. We have other examples that I won't go super into detail. We have a Boolean for setting up IPv6. If you say true, we will uh, grab an IP address from our internal systems that delegates stuff like that. Uh, we'll mo load all the modules and blah, blah, blah. And if you turn it off, we will remove all the modules and blacklist them and blah, blah, blah. We have some methods for determining whether you're in one of our layer three clusters, which is our new style clusters, or layer two clusters. We have a, um, ha we have an, uh, a hash of, of cron jobs. There's one other example that I think is really kind of cool, um, DSR. And for those of you who don't work in big web shops, you may not be familiar with DSR. It stands for Direct Server Return. Um, or if you work with F5s, it's NPATH for no apparent reason. Um, and the way it works is if you have a lot of outgoing traffic, rather than have to buy 400 million load balancers, you have your traffic flow through a load balancer to your back end, and your back end responds directly to a client. And as you might imagine, there's a fair amount of config that needs to happen on your servers for this to work properly. I mean, in fact, it changes very significantly whether you're in a layer two or layer three network, whether you want v4 or v6. And so it was really hard in CF Engine to configure this, like super hard. And so we made it super easy. There's a function. You go, hey, I need a DSR VIP. Here's the IP address I need. And it'll configure everything on your box, all the routes, all the addresses, everything that's necessary um, to do what you need to do based on where you are. So let's talk a little bit about our chef infrastructure. Um, which I imagine is what most of you are excited about. And I need to start with a disclaimer. We run open source Chef and private Chef. Um, it was really important to, to me personally, but also to other people at Facebook, that we were eventually going to be able to run full-size Facebook clusters on open source Chef. And it was really important to us because we wanted to make sure that we could leverage what the community was doing, but also that the community, community could leverage what we were doing. We also bought Private Chef for a variety of reasons. We bought Private Chef because we wanted support. We bought Private Chef because all the scalability stuff that was going into and it eventually became Chef 11 was going to hit Private Chef before it hit Open Source Chef, and we wanted early access to that. There's also a handful of nice features um, that make management a little bit easier. And finally, there were some critical features that we wanted for the testing uh, infrastructure that we built. Um, but it's really important for me to emphasize, for those of you who cannot afford to or are not yet ready to buy Private Chef, that you can run Facebook-sized clusters, and we'll talk about those in a minute, on Open Source Chef. So before I show you a picture of our environment, there's a couple things you need to understand. We wanted our Chef servers to be stateless. We wanted them to be treated like commodity hardware. We wanted to be able to reimage them at a moment's notice. Um, so that meant we couldn't use search. Um, and there's a couple reasons we couldn't use search. That's just one of them. Um, but we also use whitelist node adders, so there's no data on the server for you to search. So it'd be kind of pointless. Um, we don't use data bags for similar reasons. We wanted separate failure domains. Every, every Facebook cluster has its own um, separate chef infrastructure, which means that search would also not be terribly useful, because even if there was data there, it would only be data about your cluster, not about the world. Um, and finally, we, we use the tiered model. And for those of you who are not private chef uh, customers, um, 
what this means is we have a couple stateless front ends that run things like the API front end, and then we have back ends which run Couch and Postgres and Redis and Solar and blah, 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 blah. So this is what it looks like. You have code. Code is cookbooks, roles, whatever. And <clears throat> you write a cookbook or you change a cookbook, you write a role, and you send it off for code review. And hopefully you test it first, but we'll get to that. And you have to pass code review. Code review by a fellow engineer. And if it's a core cookbook that provides an API for everyone, then it has to be someone on the chef team. And then you have to pass lint. And in our case, lint means food critic for chef correctness and tailor for general Ruby style. And assuming you pass all of these hurdles, you get to commit. And when you commit, you commit to head on an SVN repo. And for those of you who are shuddering a little bit when I say subversion, don't worry, we use Git to wrap it. Uh, at that point, as soon as you've committed to head, every single one of our clusters are pulling those cookbooks and rolls and uploading them. And how does that happen? Well, let's zoom into a cluster. Each cluster has two backends. Those backends are not both active at the same time. It's, it's a warm failover. Each backend is completely independent of the other one. Um, and each backend runs a little piece of software that we wrote called Grocery Delivery. Grocery Delivery is a small shell script. It checks out the subversion repo and updates it every minute. And when it updates it, it looks at all the differences between the last time it did an update and now. And any cookbook that was changed, it uploads locally. And any role that was changed, it uploads locally. And anything that was deleted, it deletes. The deletion logic was a little tricky, but it's basically a very simple shell script. And both backends are doing this all the time. And in fact, every cluster has the exact, looks exactly like this. So roles and cookbooks in sync all the time. What this means is you don't have to worry about knife upload and, well, do I have to upload it to every, every Facebook cluster? That sucks, right? Like, no. You check in, every cluster will handle itself. If a machine goes down and misses a bunch of updates, who cares? Comes back up, updates itself. You re-image a box, who cares? It'll do all the uploads. We have a bunch of stateless front ends, um, which just means they're running less services and they talk to a back end for, for their back end services. And we have a bunch of servers that run Chef against it. Um, <clears throat> There's a couple assumptions that we have to keep in mind when we write cookbooks. Um, so as I said, we run things stateless, so there's no data persistence. Um, we, because we whitelist all the node adders, there's just nothing that you're ever going to keep in a node object from run to run. There's no data bags. Grocery delivery keeps roles and cookbooks in sync, and Chef only knows about the cluster it's in. And there's some details that go along with this. If you don't have persistence um, within your node data, you need something to be persistent. Like, it turns out that the world exists between chef runs. So we have a couple systems of record internally. We have our inventory management system, and we have a system that groups nodes into groups. Um, and so we pull that data with an OHI plugin, and it's available for the duration of your chef run. Um, <clears throat> our front run list is forced on every run. So node objects that exist on the server com are completely ephemeral. We don't care. We can throw them away. It's sometimes occasionally useful to run a knife command and get some status information. Um, but the reality of it is we can throw them all away at a moment's notice. On the client, we have a report handler that takes last run, last exception, blah blah blah, blah and shoves it all into our internal monitoring system. And on the server side, <coughs> we take all the stats from all of the daemons and all of the errors from all of the daemons, and we shove them into our internal monitoring system as well. And we decided to open source this script because it was super generic. Um, and it works on both open source and private chef, and you can get it on GitHub. And it just dumps out a JSON object. And I'm pretty sure that no matter what monitoring system you have internally, you can take a JSON object and do something useful with it. Now the question on everyone's mind is, does it scale? Well, um, in order to talk about whether or not it scales, we have to define scale. And for anyone wondering, that is, in fact, a picture of one of our data centers. So what does it mean to scale? Well, Facebook has clusters of around 10,000 nodes each. Um, and we do 15-minute convergence. Sh chef client is croned every 15 minutes with a 14-minute play. Grocery delivery runs every minute, so give or take, you're probably getting every change you check into the entire fleet with about 15 minutes, but 30 minutes, worst case. We have lots of clusters, and I can't tell you how many clusters we have. Um, one of our PR guys is somewhere out there. Um, but I will tell you that we have multiple clusters in a data center, multiple data centers in a region, and multiple regions. So if you do a little bit of math, you can make some guesses. So let's talk about, uh, I'm going to show you some graphs. And these graphs have numbers on them. Um, 
And so when Chef 11 came out, we'd been working with Opscode for quite a while. Um, we'd been seeing early versions of all of the uh, Earth Chef stuff. We were super excited about it. And so when Chef 11 came out, I downloaded it, and I was super excited to, to really see what it could do. And so I decided I was going to throw two clusters at open source Chef 11. This was like the pre-alpha build. So what you're looking at here is a graph. The red line is CPU idle on the active backend, and the blue line is the number of nodes. And so you can see we started off, uh, there's 9,000 active nodes, um, and that was because it was, while it was a big cluster, not everything in the cluster was converted. We started with just web servers. And you can see that we're running at about 80% CPU idle. And so that's pretty good. I deleted all of the nodes. And then I all at once threw two clusters worth of web servers at one chef infrastructure. And uh, the caveat here is that open source chef has a slightly cheaper cre client creation model than private chef. Um, but it still has to do more work than just checking in. And so there's a fair amount of work that happens here. And what you can see is that we drop down to 67% CPU idle while we register 17,000 nodes. And even in the open source model, that's pretty impressive. What's even more impressive is that when we sat there and let everything stabilize, CPU idle went back up to around 80%. So 80% for 17,000 nodes checking in every 15 minutes is pretty impressive. So let's, let's go back in time. So that was like December-ish. Let's go back in time. Uh, when we first started rolling out Chef, one of the, things that we, one of the reasons we bought private Chef was because they had moved um, the th I think it was three most heavily used API endpoints to the new Erlang server and Postgres. And everything else was still on the Ruby server and Couch. Um, and I didn't know anything about Couch when, when we started deploying um, Chef, but I, I now hate it with a passion. Um, so we started rolling out, and um, we were in one cluster. We got all of our cookbooks ready. That was like, I don't know, eight months of work or so to build the infrastructure. And we start rolling out. And I throw 700 nodes. I threw another 700 nodes. I threw another 700 nodes. And what I noticed was every time I threw 700 nodes at it, the amount of CPU, I CPU idle I lost was going up exponentially. It wasn't like linear. Well, it wasn't quite exponential, but I was losing more and more every time than I expected to. And so we got to this point on the left-hand side of the graph where I was at 50% CPU idle on the old version of, of Private Chef um, with only 4,000 nodes. And 4,000 nodes was not enough, like not, not even close. And I was losing so much more CPU from, from, from uh, deployment to deployment that I didn't actually feel comfortable going any further. So I filed a ticket, and I called Adam, called Adam up. And I was like, so, so, so this isn't scaling. And he was like, yeah, we can probably, I think the phrase he used was put more thrust on that pig. And because uh, Adam's awesome. And uh, so we sat down, and we talked. And he said, but you know what? We're just finishing up the complete rewrite on Erlang. And I said, OK. And he said, did you want to try that? And I said, well, does it work? And he said, I think so. <laughs> it's, it's got some unit tests and stuff. And I said, well, are you using it in, in Hosted Chef? And he goes, she's no, not even close. <laughs> well, do you have a customer that's using it? No. And I said, well, uh, we're Facebook. Fuck it, let's do it. And uh, so we did. So about a week later, he came to me with a uh, monkey head USB stick. And he was like, here you go. You will be the first person to ever use this. And I went, awesome, let's do it. So I installed it. And you can see where I installed it here, because all of our data drops off. Um, and we do the upgrade. And we only upgrade the primary. And so what you're looking at here is, again, red is the CPU idle of the active backend. Blue is, again, number of nodes. But green is the standby backend. It has zero nodes. Nobody's talking to it. So we do the upgrade. And what we noticed was with 4,000 nodes, all of a sudden it was 85% CPU idle. And Adam and I went, well, something's wrong. We can't possibly be doing chef runs and have 85% CPU idle. So we looked, and I made some changes, and then when they got pushed out, OK, well, chef runs are happening, so the stats must be wrong. So then we were reporting stats differently in this version. Nope, stats are correct. Like, damn. So that's why there's this big, huge, long thing there, because we couldn't believe that it was actually working as well as it was. So after we figured out that everything was actually working the way it was, and I want to point out here that kind of the cool thing about this graph is that that standby is using more CPU with zero nodes, sitting idle, than the new software was with 4,000 nodes. The old software idle 
was using more CPU than the new software with 4,000 nodes. That was kind of impressive. So once I was happy with that, I started throwing more nodes at it. Um, and you, this, the graph is a bit zoomed out here. There's actually a small stepwise function in there. Um, so I started throwing more nodes and more nodes and more nodes. And as I said, in Private Chef, because there's a role-based access control mechanism, client creation is much more expensive than in Open Source Chef. Um, so the backend's actually doing a fair amount of work here every time we throw nodes at it. And uh, we, throw, we threw nodes at it until we'd hit the entire cluster, which was 7,000 nodes. Um, and you can see that even despite this more expensive node creation, we didn't drop below 70% CPU idle. And then it came back up to 79%. So it leveled out at 7,000 nodes using exactly as much CPU as the old software with no nodes. I can't imagine rewriting a piece of software with no regressions that makes that much difference. So yes, it scales. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about testing. Uh, at Facebook, we test in production. We really do. And so, I started rolling this out, or well, before we started the official rollout, when we were kind of building the infrastructure and planning it, I was like, well, testing in CF Engine sucks. Um, people mostly do it by chattering files. And if I could delete chatter from every system I have, I would. Um, so we needed something better. And what we ended up building was the one thing that heavily relies on private chef. Um, we use multi-tenancy, which for those of you who use hosted chef, you understand it's just multiple orgs. Um, it's, the one, it's one of the big differentiators between private chef and, and open source chef. And we wanted to use that for testing. Um, and the way we use it is we made a wrapper. And when you want to test a diff, you uh, get an org and a user. You upload your Git repo of cookbooks and roles to your org. You pick a server in production. It logs into that server and ties that server to your org. And then you run chef until you're happy. And when you're happy, you say, hey, look, I tested on the server, and it works. What's best about this is that an hour later, if you don't do anything, it reverts to production. So there's no stale system sitting out there running Phil D's version of Chef from three weeks ago. And it looks like this. You run init. You get a user and an org. You run test minus s in a server, and it does all of the uploads and goes to that server and does all the magic. You log in that server, and you run Chef. And if you don't like what happened, you change your code, and you rerun upload. Works really, really well. You could build something like this with Open Source Chef. Um, it would require a lot more plumbing and probably some VMs. Um, but for us, the, the ease of use of orgs was, was really, really worth it. We learned a lot of lessons as we replaced one infrastructure with another. And let's talk a little bit about what we learned. Um, idempotent systems are way better than idempotent records in a very large environment um, because no one ever cleans anything up. Uh, I think this applies to small environments as well. Um, even if you're one dude, you probably don't remember to clean up after yourself all the time. Um, we also learned that delegating um, delta configuration makes for far, far easier heterogeneity. Um, if you can delegate the p bits and pieces you don't care about to someone who does care about them, it's one less thing you have to care about. Full programming languages are better than restrictive DSLs. The CF Engine 2 DSL is incredibly restrictive. Um, and ha not being able to loop, just not OK. Um, and there are other tools out there that have, um, that have DSLs as well. Um, scale is more than just the number of clients. There, I can throw a lot of clients at a CF Engine 2 server. CF Serve D can handle a copious number of clients. Um, that doesn't mean it scales the way I want it to scale. Um, easy abstractions are super, super critical to being able to delegate things and being able to scale the number of people that you need to manage your infrastructure. Uh, being able to tell people that you can call a function that'll add a, a DSR VIP to your, all of the things needed for a DSR VIP to your machine um, is way, 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 way easier and puts a lot less load on the networking team or the chef team um, than having a bunch of people have to try and figure out what all the if config files in the route files are. Um, testing against real systems is both useful and necessary. And I am not saying that it is the only test. Um, there are a lot of environments, say if you work at a bank, where that probably shouldn't be your first test. However, it should be a test. Because no matter what test you run, until you've seen it in production, you don't know it works. So we talked about types of scale at the beginning of this talk. And then I talked to you about all the infrastructure we built and why I think it applies to people of varying different uh, infrastructures of varying different sizes. Let's see uh, <clears throat> how this measures up to those types of scale. 
Well, if we were running homogenous systems, how many could we run? Well, I don't have homogenous systems, but what I do know is that I ran 17,000 nodes converging every 15 minutes um, against a chef infrastructure. And that hum it was heterogeneous. And homogenous systems are easier, sort of computationally. And so, and since I had lots and lots of CPU to left, I can run way, way, way more than 17,000 homogenous nodes. And I don't know what that number is. I also know that I can run more than 17,000 heterogeneous systems because I did it and I was at 80% CPU idle. How many people are needed? My chef team is, the, the team I work on in chef is, is four people, including myself. Um, people have come and gone over, the, over, over time, but it's always been roughly four people. Um, and can we delegate, safely delegate delta configuration? Yeah, dude, it's a cookbook with some hashes in it. I want to say thanks. Um, I want to thank, say thank you to everyone at Opscode who's been incredible. Um, I want to particularly thank Adam, who is probably the single best community advocate um, I've ever seen working for a commercial company. Uh, Chris Brown, who I've pissed off many times and still is nice to me. Thank you. Um, Stephen Dana is on the support staff over there, and he is a rock star. If you haven't checked out some of the Knife plugins he's written, you should. Um, the Earthchef team, uh, who spent months um, under some pressure from us to, uh, to get Earthchef out the door. Um, you guys rock. I also want to thank Andrew Crump, who is across the pond. Uh, food critic rules. Um, I cannot imagine delegating chef code to other people without some sort of correctness testing. Um, so if you haven't checked out Food Critic for correctness testing of your cookbooks, you should. Um, everyone I work with and have worked with over the past year and a half on this project, Aaron, Bethany, David, Casey, Larry, Pedro, Tyler, you guys are all awesome. And that's all I got.